117 million lost work days and $100 million each year. That's what the mental health conditions are costing employers' bottom line. By addressing mental health issues in the workplace, employers can effectively care for staff while hopefully increasing employee retention and productivity. I'm honored to introduce to you today three mental health professionals, two of whom you will hear from today, so that we can learn more about the pressing issue of addressing mental health in the workplace and also learn about real solutions that are available right here in our own community. Dr. Mary Freitag <laughs> is an integrated psychologist with a private practice in the St. Croix Valley area. Dr. Mary has taught at both the University of Minnesota Medical School's Department of Psychiatry and at St. Thomas University Graduate School of Psychology. After 15 years of seasoned practice, she developed and opened Spirit Woods in Stillwater, which you'll hear more about today, and I believe you have some things on your table for that as well. Jesse Silkowski is a master's level clinical social worker currently working in private practice in Lower Town St. Paul. Through her practice, Hope and Outreach Therapy Services, Jesse provides mental health therapy for adolescents and adults with a specialty in addressing trauma experiences. Jesse has a passion for and extensive experience with connecting underprivileged folks with community resources. Kylie Davis is a master's level licensed clinical social worker at North St. Paul High School. She's been working in the district uh, for 12 years, lives in our community, and is an incredible resource for our students in 622. In addition to her work with the district, Kylie also works as a therapist with Hope and Outreach Therapy Services. Please help me welcome Kylie and also today's pre presenters, Dr. Mary Freitag and Jesse Slokowski. Uh, a whole health approach in the treatment of um, patients and their families. And by whole health approach, I mean mind, body, and spirit. Um, the uh, areas, um, just to give you a little bit about myself, I think Melissa's pretty much covered this. Um, I, I am a big believer in research, in other words, outcome measures of the work that we do so that we can know is what we're doing really working? Because if it isn't, we're wasting your money and time, and it's, um, it's not going to be effective. So um, areas of expertise that I focus on is mindfulness-based therapies, and that's pretty much in the mainstream these days, um, and also right brain healing. And what I mean by that, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that later, is that we're really focusing on the right brain. Talk therapy is left brain. Um, but when we incorporate right brain healing, we're doing a more holistic approach to whole health healing. And you are, Jesse. Okay, there's a nice picture of uh, not my building, but um, okay. So I like she did a great job. Yes, um, Melissa did a great job introducing me as well. Um, I do have some history of working with. Uh, Ramsey County in um, supervisor positions, um, the Ramsey County uh, Mental Health Center, and so I had an opportunity to collaborate with um, St. Paul Police and Ramsey County Probation and create some cross-programming um, to help, like, I, like she said, I have a passion for accessing services for the underprivileged communities. So we were able to increase um, access for probationers to follow through with mental health and chemical health recommendations by their probation officers up to 50 percent of, of an improvement there so um, i have a, also a very strong passion for for working with those particular communities so um, i also worked with the homeless shelter response program to ramsey county um, to help open up the bethesda site um, and now i'm working in private practice um, as so um, spent some time working in primary care clinics and we'll talk about this later too the passion that we both have for breaking down the stigma around mental health and how that becomes a barrier for people to access services so um, working in the primary care clinics I was a mental health consultant which is a program created for exactly that purpose it's how do we coordinate and treat the whole person with uh, both medical and mental health at the same time. At the Ramsey County Mental Health Center, we were doing the same thing. We were incorporating medical treatments into the mental health center. So it's um, really neat to see how the community is responding in a way to try to break down those, those barriers and um, create that equity in treatment of mental health and medical conditions. 
And then it just reviews again, anxiety, depression, trauma, trauma specific therapies is my passion as well. And um, they're again, accessing services. Okay, so we've had 150 years of psychotherapy and the world is getting worse. So not necessarily because we're adding to that, but because we're missing something. So here's a guy that's saying, you know, ever since my girlfriend moved to Alaska, she seems cold and distant. Um, we can talk about that, which is what our left brain, that's what we're engaging, but with right brain, we're going to be looking at emotions and sensations and all of the responses that we have when we're in trauma or when we have a trauma response. And so, um, I'm going to move this tape, whoop, let me do this here. So, um, the risk factors for mental illness. An increase in financial stressors, reduced income, increased cost of living, job loss, unable to pay renters or rent, loss of home, loss of connection to a spiritual community, change in marital status. Thank you. Oh, very good. Uh, chronic illness, my. And uh, recent loss of loved ones um, in strained relationships and social isolation. Um, I have to get used to hearing this voice. So, so I want to just ask you guys, does this look familiar to you since 2020? So the mental illness issues have really multiplied since the pandemic. And we're gonna talk about this because we are now, the, the World Health Organization just announced we are post-pandemic. We, the, it's, it's uh, the end is in sight. Um, and so we're left with a lot to clean up. I want to let you take this, Jesse. Go. Um, so I also want to just address those risk factor factors that are um, there for suicide. Obviously, this is not a full list. That's not possible. But I would add to this list um, traumatic brain injury. Um, probably uh, stressful life events would be a, a predictor. Um, like. Oh, sorry, like rejection, divorce, financial crisis, um, other, finan or other life transitions and losses, child abuse, neglect, or trauma. Um, but again, not an all-inclusive list, and, and it's probably impossible to fully predict or prevent suicide, but we can look at these factors as a guide um, of things to, to look further into. So um, statistics are always important. So um, knowing the uh, most up-to-date rates of suicide at present, um, at present time, um, some of these might be surprising, some might not be for you, but the rate of suicide highest in middle-aged white men um, is almost 70%. Um, so that's the highest for, for white males. Um, men die by suicide almost four times more than women, um, 130 suicides per day. It's kind of hard to comprehend that. Um, one death every 11 minutes. Um, in 2020, firearms accounted for 52% um, of all suicide deaths, which I think is significant as well. And as a therapist, that's one of the first questions I always assess for is any firearms in the home, just looking for risk factors. Um, children of parents who die by suicide are three times more likely to die by suicide than children of living parents, which I think um, is really important for people to know as well, um, to consider as a protective, um, a protective factor when you're trying to develop some engagement in, in therapy. Um, you know, so uh, many who attempt never seek professional care, and that again goes to back to things around stigma, which we're going to talk further about later, but. Um, so race and ethnicity is just a little breakdown here of who is the most um, impacted. Um, highest rates, well the overall rate, 3.5 per 100,000. Highest rates, um, I thought was fascinating, it's American Indian Alaskan Natives, 23.9, um, very high. Um, whites also 16.8, quite high. Um, quite a large gap then between um, them and black, Hispanic, Asian, Pacific Islanders, who all seem to be about the same, similar category um, for, for numbers. So, um, of course, there's probably a whole lot of factors, complex reasons for these numbers to exist, and um, that would be a whole nother training, probably. So, um, 
lots of things to consider there. Um, special populations. So um, highest attempt rates are in youth. That's attempt rates. Um, they, uh, there is one suicide for every 100 to 200 attempts. Uh, overall suicide rate um, or suicide um, is similar to general, the general population. Uh, suicide is the second leading cause of death in, in 10 to 34 year olds. Also very hard to comprehend that number. Um, however, I, like, it's very clear youth do attempt more often than they complete. Um, I also want to make that clear that just because somebody is attempting many times or stating that they're suicidal many times doesn't mean they won't complete it. So we do always take it seriously when someone's making statements of suicide. Um, and there should be uh, numbers on your tables too that are for the crisis lines in your area and how to access those services. Um, I want to point out a couple things on that sheet. The first number is a brand new one actually. It's um, Star Star Crisis and it, um, if you call that number from anywhere in the state of Minnesota you will automatically be connected to the county crisis line for your area. So if you're hanging out in Bemidji, you can call that number and you will get connected to that county crisis team. I did list um, our local county crisis numbers as well. Either number would work. Uh, and the last number on the sheet I think is really important too because it is um, unusual. It's different than the other ones. It's a peer support specialist line. So um, anyone can call and speak to somebody who has lived experience with mental health conditions, depression, anxiety, um, and they're certified and trained through the state of Minnesota. Um, and I, I think a lot of folks feel much more comfortable talking to somebody who identifies as I have experienced, even though I do believe we all have mental health. Um, so <clears throat> on the mental health crisis lines, there are peer supports that work in those teams as well. So um, highest death rates were in the elderly per 100,000. Um, age 65 and older suicide rate is 14.7. Um, again, white men over 85 were the highest rate. Um, one suicide death for every four attempts and in months prior, 75% had visited a physician, which again, I find extremely important to know that. Um, <clears throat> and why, again, that mental health consultant Thank you. Role is so important in our local clinics. They're available in health partners and in a line of clinics across the board. So if you go in to see your doctor, how many people have gone in and filled out that depression assessment as part of your standard procedure? That's fairly new practice. Uh, but that's exactly what this is about. How do we capture all those individuals who come in to see their doctor um, and get them connected quickly with a mental health person, which is also one of the biggest issues we face in our society is excuse me, quick access, fast access to services. Um, okay, there's one other stat I wanted to add to this. It's not on here. Um, veteran suicide in 2019, that rate uh, was shocking to me, 31.6 per 100,000 as well. So I think that's important. I d recently did start working with the vets um, providing trauma support services. Um, so this is a population that needs quite a lot of support as well. Um, am I on the rates? Yes. Rates of suicide by occupation. I thought definitely this group would be interested to know this. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think there might be, again, some surprises and maybe not on this list. Um, so, you know, I can, again, there's a lot of factors that play into this as well. Um, social isolation on the job, um, access to guns. Um, uh, there's enormous amounts of trauma that a lot of folks experience on the job that puts them at higher risk as well. And then I think this is you, Mary. Okay, thanks, uh, Jesse. So um, when it comes to trauma or just mental illness in general, uh, we talked a little bit about how that's been exacerbated from COVID. And um, the World Health Organization just announced that the end is in sight um, for the pandemic. So employers around the world really have to know how to respond to the increased um, mental health issues that we're experiencing. Um, Wall Street Journal reported that starting this month, um, attendance will be expected and office resistors will be put out of, on notice at several large corporations in the US. And most employers are urging workers to head back to the office for at least a few days a week. 
and employers need to take steps to protect the workers' mental health and well-being as they return to the offices. Um, so one in four people will experience mental illness in their lives, costing the global economy an ex estimated $6 trillion by 2030. This is uh, a stat brought out by the World Health Organization and one of their trust funds, that, or trust um, uh, organizations that had did um, research. And um, wide-scale introduction of, of the hybrid working gives us the opportunity to take the best from home working and office-based work and provide a more balanced and healthier solution for all. But there are um, uh, plenty of organizations out there that are not giving people that choice. And so the research that's coming out of that is showing that people who don't have a choice are finding less meaning, uh, meaning in their work, um, which is a um, risk factor for uh, depression. They're finding less support at work, and in our work life, 60% of our time is spent there, and our work uh, colleagues and team members um, really take uh, our second to family. I mean, so um, they're very, very important in our lives. So as a result of that, we might see what we call quiet quitting. Has anyone here heard the, the quiet quitting terminology? Yeah, so that's been kind of nationwide. Uh, it's really taken off. And that is a warning sign because now we're already starting to deal with mm, distance and strained relationships with colleagues and employers. Um, sustain, a sustained uh, depressed mood, sleep problems, change in appetite, loss of interest, loss of energy, fatigue. So a lot of us can have these experiences and not really understand that what we're really up against, what we're actually experiencing. And it's important for us to be aware um, when our colleagues are experiencing this too, so that we can um, be proactive, and we'll talk about that. Irritable, agitation, um, feelings of guilt and hopelessness, feeling helpless to affect change, and that's what's happening for individuals who are in organizations that are not allowing them a more hybrid approach to their work life. Um, so, so the media responses to quiet quitting is, is pretty much put them into two camps. One of them is, oh, you know, kids these days. Um, the, the problem is posed as generational worker problem. Nobody wants to do work anymore. This new generation is lazy. They want everything handed to them. So that's a bias and a judgment um, that some people can experience. The other camp is it's the worker's environment. A natural, although unfortunate, reaction to workplace <coughs> culture, policies, job design, workload. Employees are struggling with the rapid social transitions and the workplace needs to be changed. So the blame here is placed on the workers' environment. So the Alliance partners suggest that the mental health support needs to be visible through the work, uh, the employer, regular awareness building, accessible, provide support for uh, via vis uh, physical and digital uh, means, and valid and multi-pronged, so no single support system will be addressed. So I've interviewed a number of folks, one in a corporate setting, one in a medical facility, and one in a, uh, an academician, and all of them have said that their employer has um, the policy of sending out a, uh, a company-wide email um, when there are um, current events going on. So Apple River, um, George Floyd, um, the Roseville event that we had uh, maybe a week or two ago. Um, the email is a reminder that, you know, sometimes these events can trigger you, so be aware of that. And if you um, uh, want someone to talk to, you know, contact this person or dial this number. So that's where, that's an example of the employers being more proactive. Um, so we kind of went through this, um, so here's what employers need to do now, seize the opportunity to add real value to their employees' lives. This is about addressing uh, quiet quitting. Contribute to a society where mental health and well-being are not discussed in the shadows, but addressed and supported in the light of day. And take a participatory approach in institutional organizational support systems 
by requiring managers to be trained to respond quickly and adequately to employees, um, <coughs> training workers in mental health literacy and awareness to improve their knowledge on the subject, and so some of that's accomplished by the, the, the system-wide emails that go out, um, and provide opportunities for employees to acquire stress management skills, mindfulness, self-reflection, uh, self problem solving, uh, exercise, activity. So we're going to prevent burnout by watching for quiet quitting, encouraging support from your teammates, support outside of work, strengthen your social networks, and um, valued relationships, encourage participation in your wellness programs, balance between work and home, and support use of paid time off. So we are going to move on down because we're really short on time. Thank you, Nathan. So what are ways that we can address this? Um, the areas um, of intervention that incorporate right brain healing, which is really a more holistic approach that both Jesse and I engage in. Um, accelerated resolution therapy is art, is one of the, the primary interventions. Um, and so I work with the Minneapolis Police Department, uh, firefighters, first responders, and this intervention is probably the best intervention that I've ever worked with. Uh, and the outcomes are terrific with it. Um, another one is accelerated experiential di AEDP, experiential dynamics. So again, it's all incorporating right side. So when the, when the person goes in, they don't have to talk and talk about the event, the trauma. They're actually focusing on uh, emotion sensations and processing them through through bilateral, what we call bilateral stimulation of the brain. Um, and. Um, uh, sensory, uh, uh, sensory processing, and mindfulness techniques, et cetera, here. Nature immersion is also very right brain. Um, do you want to add anything to that? Because we are down to a minute. <laughs> um, I don't know if I could sum up in a minute what I would like to add. <laughs> OK. Um, yeah, talking about stigma. Yeah. But, um, hmm. Oh, we're, done. we're done. Okay, we, we are done. Okay, so before we, so, so again, both Jesse and I, um, you guys have our information uh, on your tables. And for questions, please talk to us afterwards if you wish to, because we will be here. And thank you very much. Big topics. Okay, I'm just going to say open it up. Okay. We have time for maybe one or two questions, real quick questions for Mary or Jesse. Yes, Tony. Yes. Um, can you define for me what middle age means? <laughs> Love it. That's always a moving target, isn't it? Well, <laughs> the older I get, yeah. right, the more middle aged I am. Yeah, yes. numbers, I mean, I'm really surprised at those numbers of mm -hmm. white middle aged men. So, mm -hmm. Yes, and, yes. And to piggyback on that, what, what is that age range, and also why do you think that is the case? Well, wow, wow. why do we think that's the case? Yeah, that's There's a really complex one. Yeah. <laughs> um, we can just name off uh, career transitions, um, uh, changes in life. I also know that isolation is a big part of it, and um, the, there are high, way higher numbers in rural communities versus urban. Yeah. So again, isolation is a factor there. Um, again, um, access to guns has also been proven to be a factor. So. Um, it's yeah. There's and that's not just that's not the only ones. There are many factors that play into this. Wait, but you didn't answer the age. Oh, yeah. Um, I feel like I feel like I, I should not answer that. I don't know. <laughs> I'm gonna just pass. <laughs> All right, Mary and Jesse, you'll be available afterwards. Yeah. If we you will. Have. Okay. Great. Thank you. We got our, everybody, everybody has a card. Everyone have their business card in the bucket. And thank you again very much. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Ha, ha, ha.